Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, today, we're going to have Module 3, Trauma-Informed Care, as presented by the Native Na National Native Children Trauma Center um, for our Foundationals and Juvenile Healing to Wellness Court Coordination. Um, we've got Veronica Willetto de Crane. She's a Training and Technical Assistance Manager for the National Native Children's Trauma Center. Um, and she's going to discuss supporting participants with a trauma-informed approach and also providing information on mitigating childhood traumatic stress, as well as principles that focus on education, prevention, and healing design for child-serving systems. So thank you, Veronica, um, for presenting today. We're looking forward to um, the discussion. And I should also note that she is the co-host of the Tribal Youth Resource Center podcast, and um, I'm happy to work with her um, and consider a really great colleague. So with that, I'll uh, hand it off to Veronica to get things started. Thanks, Jacob. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying this time together, even though it's only virtually, but I know um, it's always a great um, opportunity whenever you have a chance to just kind of take a step back from your day-to-day -day tasks and just connect with others who are who share the same passions as you do and maybe are um, facing some of the same challenges. So I hope you're enjoying this time together. As Jacob said, I am Veronica Willetto D. Crane and um, with the National Native Children's Trauma Center. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And the next slide. Thank you. So um, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. I'm Dana. Such is but what Dan Asha, um, Billings, Montana, that cashed in. So I live in Billings, but I'm from a small community on the Navajo Nation called Oho and Sino, and that's where I was raised. Um, I still have family there and um, still go back there and visit often. And um, Let's see, before I came to the trauma center, my background is actually in youth development and education. And I particularly focused on addressing, responding to behaviors of students in education. Um, I was really concerned about the impact of our discipline and responses to behavior on native students and um, really wanted to provide support to uh, educators around that. So I also um, did some work with youth development and providing um, community, family, and youth programming to um, communities on the Crow Reservation. So that's a little bit about my background and at the trauma center, um, I have the fortune of um, being a part of the Tribal Youth Resource Center work. Um, we have a partnership with the Tribal Youth Resource Center and our center is really focused on providing any tri tribal child serving agency with support around trauma-informed care. So you might have other ways of, of naming this type of work. Some folks call it trauma resilient uh, resiliency building or resilience building or healing centered care. Um, but it started out as uh, an area of work that was focused on trauma informed care. So I'll be using that term a lot today. And for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, we are located in Missoula, Montana, on the campus of the University of Montana. And um, we started out in 2003, providing direct services to native youth in schools in Montana. So we did some trauma interventions and really took some of the evidence-based trauma treatments and tried to see if they would um, have be helpful to tribal students in Montana. And so that's where we got started. And then um, since then have grown in our work and have become a 
what we're known as is a category two trauma treatment center. We're part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And as a category two trauma treatment center, we um, fulfill the role of providing training and technical assistance. So we no longer do direct services, but just try to provide support to those that do. So that's what brings me here today. Um, and really just trying to provide some introductory information around trauma-informed care. Next slide. So what I'm hoping um, to cover today is um, really taking the framework that SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health um, Services Administration um, has developed uh, and really talking about some of the um, assumptions around trauma-informed care and the principles. And then hopefully we'll have some conversation around how this applies to the juvenile healing tool wellness court environment and to your roles as coordinators. Next slide. So before we begin talking about that framework, I want to just provide some brief information about trauma, um, just to have some shared um, terminology as hopefully um, we can have a little bit of a conversation during the next hour or so that we have. Um, so um, first of all, you know, just want to pose the question of why talk about trauma? So for me personally, um, in my tribal background, I've been taught that it's not always a good thing to talk a lot about topics like these, um, that it's not healthy for us and not helpful. And so when we do talk about it, I think there should be good reasons why we do. And so, um, so that's why I like to ask this question first, you know, why talk about trauma? And you guys might have your own reasons. Maybe you're familiar with um, the term trauma. Maybe you're familiar um, and you, you've gotten some, um, you've done some work in this area yourself or just from, you know, we all have personal experience around trauma. So um, maybe you have your own understanding of why we talk about it. Uh, if you wanna share any of that in the chat, you're welcome to. Um, I'll just go ahead and share some reasons why we at the Trauma Center uh, focus on this work around trauma and why we use the term trauma, even though sometimes it, it's not always welcome um, and it's not always something that people want to talk about um, and have concerns around talking about. But the reasons that we do bring it up, one of them is um, as we learned um, in studying trauma and its and if its effects on children and on just individuals is that um, it's really linked to some of the health um, public health and health issues that affect our tribal communities so for me that that a lot of the the health issues that come to my mind are suicidality um, obesity uh, diabetes, heart disease, some of these health issues that are common in our tribal communities and that where our, our communities are really trying to address. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we bring it up because we actually know that trauma has, um, is linked to those issues and that in some ways is a root cause of them. And so it really helps us to better understand how to address some of those things, um, such as substance use, uh, substance abuse, or other types of health issues that really um, may be you know, part of the work that you do. And so it's really helping to get to the root of some of those issues and how trauma may be a factor in them. Another reason is that we, when we talk about trauma, we don't just want to say that um, adversity is, um, is common in our lives, but also that 
uh, we want to be aware of the fact that it's preventable, especially in your roles uh, in the courts that you're establishing and that you uh, the ways that you're serving the youth and your community, that there are ways that um, you can in your role can help prevent trauma and we can all help prevent trauma um, in our professional lives, but also personally. And so I think that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about trauma and why we would talk about it. So people know that it's preventable and that also people know that you can heal from trauma when in those instances where trauma hasn't been prevented or where um, you really can't prevent all trauma. And so that's um, why we have to understand that we can heal from it. Um, that's the the hope around um, some of the experiences that our young people go through and that um, that our people go through is really um, focusing on the fact that we can heal from trauma, we can heal from some of those experiences um, and that they are not, they don't have to determine our destiny. And then the last one is really, um, for me, it's to ask better questions. I think we kind of touched on that when I talked about how trauma can be a root cause to some of the issues that we face in our communities, but um, it also helps us to ask better questions, um, especially as we're trying to figure out how to better support youth and how to provide um, better services and more effective services. Um, and interventions and treatment and all of those things that we, um, it really starts with asking the right questions and better questions from maybe what we've been, what we've been asking. And so we'll get more into that um, and, and further along in the presentation. So next slide. So we've been talking about this term, I'm curious, um, do you guys have any of your own uh, ways that you would, in your own words, define trauma? How, how do you describe trauma? Especially, like, how is it different from, like, daily stresses? We all have daily stress and difficulties, but what makes trauma different from that? How would you describe it. You're welcome to unmute or to put it in the chat. Any thoughts? Okay, Lloyd um, has mentioned, um, has brought up the boarding school era. Absolutely, that, that, that comes to my mind as well, um, especially right now with all of the attention that that's getting. Um, but even before that, I think that's definitely an example of trauma that we know about is very real for our communities. Elizabeth, thank you for, for mentioning um, powerlessness and injustice and that it's chronic, um, that it's not just a one-time thing that, but it, it happens. It's ongoing over and over. Not being able to shake it, yes, the feeling or thoughts that come from it. Mm -hmm. Kathleen mentions how um, just the body's response and being on alert and the hypervigilance of some of those responses to trauma you're mentioning. Thank you guys so much. 
Um, there's so much around um, our already our collective understanding of what trauma is. And I want to make sure to acknowledge that because you all bring your own experience, um, both personally, professionally, um, and um, even generational experience. And so definitely we have each of us in our own communities might have um, some knowledge and some understanding about trauma. Um, and sometimes our tribal communities have some understanding and knowledge around this topic that um, maybe Western-based research is really trying to catch up to and is just now learning about. And so one of the definitions that, that's on the screen right now, it comes from SAMHSA. Um, and it's really um, meant to kind of emphasize a couple of, a few, a few points. The first one is when we're talking about trauma, um, yes, there are certain events like we named the boarding schools. Um, there are other types of events. One of them, um, you know, one of the examples I like to give is um, if you, if there was like a, um, a bear that walked into the room that you're sitting in right now, um, the office or whether you're you're joining in from home, if there was a bear that just kind of came, came in, how would you respond to it? What would be your, your reaction? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Panic. <laughs> Jen's going to panic. I'm right there with you. I'm going to panic too because I think I was told how to react to a bear, but I don't remember. <laughs> Scream and run. Yes, you're going to be terrified. There's definitely going to be some terror. Be anxious or shut your front door, your, your office door. Yes. Any other responses to that bear? So people are gonna respond differently to a traumatic event like a bear. <laughs> Whoa, a bear <laughs> in my room, in my office. <laughs> um, and people might respond in disbelief, but people are gonna respond differently to a traumatic experience. So it often isn't the event itself that is traumatic, although there are probably some things that we can all agree on that are traumatic, um, but it's actually the experience that a person has um, with that traumatic event and how they perceive it. So some of us might run, some of us might, um, freeze. Some of us might try to figure out how to fight that bear if, if they feel like it's, a, it's threatening them or, or about to attack them. Um, and for some of us, maybe we get hurt during that experience. We actually physically get hurt. Um, we actually feel like our life was threatened. Or maybe if we personally didn't get hurt, Oh, or feel like our life was threatened where maybe we're away in the back of the room and we have, we're by an exit and we just run away and get away. Um, but maybe the rest of the people that were in that room or um, somebody that we loved got hurt or somebody that we love, um, you know, was really affected by that experience. Um, and so we all kind of experience that differently and it's not just what we personally experience, but it's also what we witness or what we know another, um, another person that we care about experiences. It could be somebody in our community. It could be somebody in our family. It could be a friend. It could be a coworker, but we're, we're concerned about their life or their safety. And then one of the things that you guys brought up already is that um, this experience is overwhelming. So that's kind of what makes it different from everyday stress is that with everyday stress, we 
you know, through, through um, normal child development, we build up um, a tolerance for stress and we build up ways to cope with it. But when something becomes traumatic and we, so we often talk about it as toxic stress, it's overwhelming. It overwhelms our senses. Um, it causes us to be terrified and horrified and um, fearful and just feel helpless and powerless. So it's really, um, that's what really distinguishes it from um, just, just everyday stress that we might experience. And then this is the reason the experience that individuals have and how we react to it differently is really the reason why sometimes some people can be exposed to trauma, but may not have long lasting impacts from it because um, they're able to recover quickly or because the experience, the way that per they perceived it was not as threatening. And so just because someone's exposed to trauma doesn't always mean that um, they are struggling with it. And so that's also another thing to really remember about trauma. Um, next slide. And there's just different types. We talked about the bear, you know, that's what you would consider an acute trauma, like a single event. Uh, chronic is maybe the bear keeps coming back. Um, so it happens over and over again, or maybe, you know, it's not just the bear, but maybe it's also a car accident. Maybe it's also being in a, a violent relationship. So those are also um, multiple different events um, that happen to a person and it just kind of um, accumulates for them. And then complex is really where um, it happens often in childhood during those years where um, there's a lot of developmental milestones happening and it really causes some detrimental effects to a person's development. And it's often at the hands of people that are supposed to be um, their caretakers or that are close to them. And so that's what makes it um, complex. That's why it has that name because it's sometimes very difficult to recover from that. You know, it's one thing to experience abuse at the hands of a stranger, but when you're experiencing at the hands of your own mother or your own father um, or your own brother, um, those are some, that, that can make it even more complicated, complicated and can have an impact on a person's development um, in a more significant way. So that's why it's complicated. And then historical is also another term and we brought up the boarding schools and that's an example of historical trauma. And what's really, um, what really makes something historical trauma is that it's, it's a collective experience and is experienced by a group of people that have a shared identity. And then on top of that, um, the trauma that's experienced is caused by an intention of genocide or ethnocide, um, which is different from intergenerational trauma that other families might go through or individuals might go through um, that may not always be linked to ethnocide or genocide. And so that's what makes, um, you know, according to according to those that study this topic and are really uh, try to provide support around this area, is really that um, that emphasis on identity and um, um, ethnic identity and um, loss of you know massive loss of life. Next slide, please. So why are we talking about this? We, we kind of covered this a little bit um, before, but I just kind of want to re review some of the reasons why we're coming back to this topic again, because um, for some of you, you know, this might be very pertinent to your strategic plan, to the, the way that you want to provide services to the, to the youth in your community, um, to those that come into your court. And so, we really want to just provide good a good foundation around why we should consider providing services in a more trauma-informed care way. 
And it's not to say that you're not already doing that. You might already be doing this, but just to be able to really intentionally say, yes, we're going to provide trauma-informed care. And so why do we need to do that? Um, first of all, you know, it really comes back to just how, um, how much of a role your courts play and how much of an impact your courts do have on youth. So knowing that you provide holistic and comprehensive case management, that really sets you up to really um, think about the different ways in which um, youth are come before you and why they end up in your care. Um, so, and that you also have, um, you might be able to be in a position where you're able to provide um, the type of care for them that maybe they, up until that point, they weren't able to get. And so you, that ability to provide holistic and comprehensive care um, puts you really in a good position. And then identifying necessary treatments, um, you know, knowing that we're really in this work to really help the youth. And that means, you know, reducing recidivism um, and really making sure that what's really going to prevent them from ending back up in the same position again or from, um, you know, going through worse experiences um, is really um, making sure that they get the kind of support and treatment that they need. And that, uh, that might be trauma treatment. That might be um, um, the root of what, what's really bringing them before you might be trauma. And so the, the solutions, the care that they need might be uh, trauma treatment. And then just knowing that, um, you know, we really want to um, provide safe environments and to prevent re-traumatization. And so knowing that, um, yeah, youth come to us in these courts already um, experiencing some trauma, but knowing that their interaction with the, with the juvenile justice system, with, with the court system may also be traumatic for them. And so maybe there's ways that we could actually um, create environments within our court to prevent re-traumatizing them, um, to, to help them to feel safe so that they can be on a path to recovery and that they can fulfill um, whatever obligations, responsibilities that they have to fulfill to the court. Um, so really knowing that we can provide safe environments is also key. Next slide. And then just being aware that, um, like I was mentioning, you know, there's a there's youth that come to that are going to come before you that are going to come already with some trauma exposure, and um, and often violent um, violent experiences, with, uh, by the time they've reached you, and just knowing that um, when we provide trauma informed care, we're actually helping them to heal from that experience. Um, and just by being able to provide a foundation of safety, um, being able to empower them um, and collaborate with them and to build trust with them and to treat them with respect. So all of these ways in which we provide trauma-informed care um, is really gonna help those youth who already come to you being exposed to trauma. But it's not just those youth who are exposed to trauma, anybody that comes into your court, um, whenever you provide trauma-informed care, whether you know their trauma history or not, it's gonna be high quality care. It's gonna be care that is good for all youth, no matter their, their histories. Um, and then also, I know a lot of you may, may be dealing with young people who are struggling with substance use, and that may be the reason why they're ending up in your court. Um, and so just knowing that, um, you know, substance use is a trauma, a, a, a coping mechanism, a way that youth have learned to cope with their trauma experiences and is often a common one. And we often um, refer to it as like self-medication 
Um, maybe they weren't able to, to learn better ways of coping. Maybe they didn't have access to certain resources in their community that would help them to cope. Maybe they um, have some gaps in their development that really causes them to lean towards more um, of these coping mechanisms that are maladaptive and that are um, not, you know, that are not serving them well. And so um, that's how they end up struggling with some of this substance use. Next slide. And so just, um, just knowing that, that um, that's, that's what they're carrying with them and why they may behave um, engaging in some of the behaviors that they do. So being aware of that and just um, being able to be in a position where you're able to intervene in some of that um, by just, you know, it could be something as referrals. So when you're establishing those collaborations with different service systems, you, you could be just referring them to treatment. It could be um, the kind of support that you're able to provide them through your case management. Um, and then just looking at your policies and procedures uh, and your protocols, and um, even just the way in which you screen youth into your, into your court, um, and really um, not just looking at their trauma history, but also trauma-informed care is also about um, looking at their strengths. And so um, knowing that even if they have a trauma history, even if they have struggles with their with behavior that is actually their trauma responses, that you can actually um, um, still um, recognize their strengths and what it is that um, they have to offer, what it is that they have going for them um, some of these survival skills that they've learned because they've been trying to um, keep themselves safe in their situations. And so they've learned some really good survival skills that they can actually, um, you know, can be used in better ways. Um, so they have some really good strengths already to offer. Um, next slide. So um, just knowing why, why do we want to care about trauma-informed care? Um, and then also um, what, what it is that you guys can do about it. So if, if you are in a position where you feel like, you know, you want to figure out how to uh, provide better care that is more trauma-informed and that you feel like maybe there are some ways that you could improve um, there's really a lot of work that's being done across different types of organizations and systems. Um, so I know um, SAMHSA has really brought together um, those who are trauma survivors as well as trauma practitioners and um, trauma researchers and have really tried to figure out um, what are some things that organizations can do to really make sure that they're providing um, good care to those that are struggling with, with trauma. And so they've actually come up with these four R's. Um, and it's really helpful to remember uh, four R's. Uh, the first R is to realize just how common um, trauma exposure can be. And that, uh, again, that there's, there's a potential for recovery for every individual that has been exposed to trauma. And realizing that, that there, you know, um, there is a possibility to heal. And then recognizing what those signs and symptoms are, especially as you're working with the youth, your clients and their families, you kind of become more aware of maybe what some of those, their behaviors are that are actually trauma responses um, that actually are signs that they may be struggling um, with PTSD, or they might be struggling with child traumatic stress, um, and, and just being able to respond in a way that is more helpful to them, um, beyond just referring them to treatment, but also uh, ways that you can interact with them um, so that you're not re-traumatizing, um, ways that you can, um, policies and procedures that you can have in place and practices that you can um, engage in that will really be supportive to those young people who are trying to recover from their 
after um, hardships and adversities. Next slide. So we're gonna go ahead and watch a film um, and it's from Oprah. Yay, any other Oprah fans? Um, so we'll go ahead and watch this film and just about what she came to understand about trauma-informed care. Veronica, just double checking, are you seeing the web page now? Yeah, and it's okay. a clock. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Let me. Okay. Here we go. A correspondent candid with Oprah Winfrey. Oprah, your story for 60 Minutes this week is about childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of new science here about trauma informed care. For, for anyone who's dealing with a traumatized child, what can they learn from your story? Well, I think that this story is going to, it is my hope that our story on trauma-informed care will not just be impactful, but will also be revolutionary. It certainly has caused a revolution in my own life. And I was struck by the story because it reminded me of my own childhood growing up in Milwaukee. It's, it's, it's not lost on me, the irony of being back in the same city, Milwaukee, where I grew up on welfare, poor, uh, a lot of negative experiences, sexual abuse and all of that. What's the difference between a really bad childhood and being able to overcome that and a traumatic childhood and someone not being able to overcome that? Really, it boils down to something pretty simple. And, and the answer that Dr. Bruce Perry gives you is relationships. If you also have opportunities to be connected to people in positive mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. uh, that can buffer yeah. some of those effects. And, and, and as you get older... I'd like to know more about that. What, what he really means is love. He's a scientist. He's not going to use the word love. But it really is about how you are responded to, valued, mm -hmm. trusted, and loved mm -hmm. by those around you. So I didn't get it from the people who I felt I should have gotten it from. It can be anybody who cares enough about you to ask the question, what happened to you? Could you trace back in your mind, it was that person who made it? I know difference. exactly who did it. I know exactly the moment I started to feel valued. And for me, it was school. I wanted to be a fourth grade teacher because of Mrs. Duncan. And I haven't seen Mrs. Duncan since then. And Mrs. Duncan is here today. <laughs> The moment I felt the most of value was in my fourth grade class when Mrs. Duncan said to me, I, I was the one who was chosen to lead the class and whatever it was. So what was I like? I don't, I don't really remember. Oh, I do remember you. That I was... remember you were such a fluent reader. Well, oh, if I had had a class full of students like Oprah, I would have been floating on air. So... Mrs. Duncan instilled in me this sense of believing that I mattered. And that is what every human being is looking for. When you first heard that I had like done something in, in life, were, oh, did you know that it was me? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I kept it with you without your being aware of it. And it was Mrs. Duncan who helped heal you? For me, yes. It was Mrs. Duncan, and then it was my, my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Graham. It was school that made me feel a sense of value and connection. You learned a lot on this story. Oh, I learned a lot on this story. This story was life-changing for me. Life-changing, really? Life-changing. And people use that word rhetorically. Mm -hmm. Life-changing. It's changed the way I operate with, in my business, with my people, with my school. One, two, three. Yeah! You say that the most important question to ask of people who have gone through trauma is not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Yeah. So when you see, you know, a church being shot up or you see, you know, all of the headline making uh, stories of people seemingly gone mad, mm. your first thought is what happened to that person? Right. Right. You know, what has been life changing for me um, is the question, what happened to you? Not what is wrong with you, but what 
happened to you which is an important question not just for people who have been so called traumatized but it's the most important question you can ask of anyone i can say that of all the stories I've ever done in my life and all of the experiences I've ever had and people I've interviewed, this story has had more impact on me than practically anything I've ever done. It's changed the way you see everyone? It's changed the way I see everyone. So when I have an employee who is acting out of line or who is just being a jerk, I don't think, what's wrong with that guy? What's wrong with that girl? What's wrong with that person? I think, I wonder what happened to them. Hmm. I wonder what happened to them. I wonder what happened that caused them to behave that way. That's what this story did for me. Awesome. I'd love to hear your reactions to this video. Do you guys wanna share that in chat? What stood out to you? Any reactions to the video? I just want to say thank you to Veronica. You oh, hi. are great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. So Anna mentioned in the chat People outside her family were able to affirm and encourage her. Absolutely. And luckily she had that at school, right? Um, when she wasn't able to get that at home, she had that at school. Paul says how important our education educators are and what an impact they make on our children. Absolutely. And so for some of the youth that maybe are coming to you, um, do they have, do they have a, a fourth grade teacher or did they have a fourth grade teacher? Do they have someone that really made them feel loved and valued and asked a better question than what's wrong with you? So, this, you know, it talks about educators, but I hope you, sorry about that. I hope you can take away from it that whether it's a teacher or whether it's, you know, a coach or, you know, someone in the community, an elder or any other person that it's really that, you know, our young people have somebody that they have a relationship with and that makes them feel valued. Jen writes, having a support system in place is absolutely necessary for healing. Yep, they might not have that at home. Yes, and that's why they need the community, right? That's why they need you and the work that you're doing in the community. Um, because not all young people will have that. And um, so that's definitely um, something to, to think about when, it, when we're really trying to understand what is trauma-informed care. You know, um, I might not be able to provide a list to you of things that you should start doing, but just knowing that the, the basis of, of it all is relationships I hope helps you to kind of see your role in it and um, maybe how to be more intentional about those relationships and the work that you do. Next slide. So we're gonna cover some of the principles of trauma-informed care. Um, this is the framework that 
SAMHSA has really helped us to um, have a better understanding of what are what are really the um, yes you know there's relationships there's love um, you know and our, how can we show that in our organization how can we show that in our courts um, so that our young people do feel that love they do have a chance to build those relationships and so we're going to cover some of these principles and I'd like you to just kind of think about, you're welcome to put in the chat ways that maybe your program or your court is already um, doing, um, living these out in, in, on a daily basis, these principles. Uh, maybe you have some good examples of what, um, what you can do to really um, help your, um, the youth that you're serving in these ways. So next slide. We'll begin with safety. That's the first principle. Next slide, please. So when we talk about safety, um, we talk about this because um, we know that it's really kind of paramount to those that have been struggling with trauma to really feel a sense of safety because in their experience, um, you know, we talked about just what, what trauma is and that's really that they felt that a person feels threatened um, that, where they don't feel safe. And so really restoring that sense of safety is what we're trying to help with. And when a young person doesn't feel safe, they're constantly in a survival mode meaning that you know their their bodies their brains are um looking out for danger they're on hyper alert they're they're not able to do logical thinking and really think through some of their choices or their behaviors they're just responding out of fear and out of um trying to survive and so to really help a child feel safe really means allowing them to get to a place where they're calm, where they're able to access their prefrontal cortexes and to make good choices and good decisions and to, to do some of that higher order thinking um, and that creative thinking. And so that's why we focus so much on safety, knowing that a child really can't change their behavior unless they feel safe. And so um, just trying to be able to provide an environment where they do feel safe, um, where everyone feels safe. Um, and that sometimes that means that we, we create an environment and we assume that they, it's a safe environment because to us, it looks safe and it, it feels safe to us but we really have to be checking in with the young people that we serve and really you know, finding out from them whether or not they feel it, uh, whether or not they're feeling that safety. And so um, it's really asking them to let us know um, whether or not your court feels safe, um, whether or not there are things that could be done differently so that they're not so much on, on a hyper alert and that they're able to um, engage with you better and engage with the court better. So next slide. The next uh, principle is trustworthiness and transparency. Um, so kind of a two for one. And this is where healing happens in relationships. So knowing that a lot of the traumatic experiences, particularly if we're thinking about abuse, whether that's been neglect or physical or sexual abuse um, that a, a young person might experience, that what often happens is that the person um, that may have gone through that may have gone through that with, with someone that was close to them, with some of their close relationships. And so because of that, they may struggle to trust people. And so 
really having your court um, in the business of reestablishing trust. Perhaps that young person doesn't trust any adults or perhaps that young person doesn't trust you because you're telling him or her that you're, um, you know, looking out for their best interest or you're there for them and you care for them and you want to see them succeed. Um, but they may struggle to trust you with that because maybe they've heard that before, but they've been let down. Um, and so really understanding their context um, and that the relationships that you set with them within your court is really going to rewire their brain to understand that they're, they, you, can, you can trust an adult and that the person that can be trusted is you and um, is their caseworker or is, their, is the judge or whoever else um, so that they're able to um, work better with you and for their own benefit. Um, and so really understanding that um, building trust with them is really important. And that comes often through just being transparent with them um, when you can be as much as you can be, um, that your court is transparent with them and um, that, you know, not, not trying to manipulate them or coerce them, but really trying to um, be transparent with them and helping them to see that you're a trustworthy person, that your program is, is a trustworthy program just by its consistency and its follow through um, and really taking their, their experience into consideration, their, their trauma histories into consideration. Next slide. So the next principle is peer support, um, principle number three. And this is really significant because some of us may really relate to the youth that we're serving. And maybe we even have some similar experiences to them. We maybe have been in the same shoes as them as they're sitting uh, before you as they are, they're walking into the court, the courtroom, um, that might have also been your experience. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe you can't relate to them um, or maybe specifically to their situation you can't relate to. So this is where it's really important um, if you're able to and your court is able to, to provide peer support. And a peer is basically someone that that youth um, can relate to who's maybe gone through similar traumatic experiences or is going through similar difficulties. And so providing peer support could just be like a mentor, um, maybe with an older youth, maybe with a youth that graduated from your program, or maybe um, with um, a staff person that can relate to them. Uh, you know, or, or being a part of some type of support group where um, that youth is able to engage with other youth who are um, going through the same experience as they are, um, as they're going through um, your program. So it's really, and not just the youth, but also I mean, any time that you can provide support groups to family, to even staff, um, because, you know, staff are also um, maybe dealing with their own trauma histories. And so any kind of, um, or even just providing like a wellness or a self-care group for staff is also an example of providing peer support. Next slide. And the fourth principle is collaboration and mutuality. And this is where, um, Recognizing the fact that, especially with our service systems, you know, uh, justice system, whether it's whether it's the education system or any kind of service system that we have in our society, that um, oftentimes the clients, those that walk in and are receiving services from us, um, often feel uh, uh, an imbalance of power. You know, there's a power imbalance. Uh, we may have control, we may have 
the power to um, that really affects um, that affects their life, and we we may be able to make decisions that affects them. And so, with collaboration and mutuality, it's really um, giving opportunities for that power imbalance to be leveled a bit, and for there to be some partnership, and um, and how that can happen within a court system with with young people who may be needing to fulfill some responsibilities and correcting some wrongs that um, that they've that they've done, and so really trying to figure out how that can happen, um, and that can just be acknowledging that there is a power imbalance. And then just being um, careful not to abuse that power, um, you know, being able to, um, whenever possible, um, try to um, invite voice, the voices of youth in, in your program um, can also help with some of that leveling uh, of the power differences. So that's um, collaboration and mutuality. And next slide. The fifth principle is empowerment, voice, and choice. So I touched on this a little bit, um, but let's dig in a little bit more. So knowing that um, a lot of the trauma that young people may experience or anybody experiences really is that um, a person might feel like they've lost control, especially as a young person. For example, if we come back to that example of, a, of abuse, you know, a child, um, a young person may not feel like they had any control over what happened to them um, for good reason, that they felt like they couldn't stop it, that they couldn't get away from that situation, that they had no choice. Um, and so there's also often this feeling of powerlessness, and that was mentioned earlier um, by one of you of just feeling powerless, feeling helpless, and that often leading to feeling hopeless. So trauma-informed care um, within our courts can really look like providing opportunities for them to grow their sense of agency and helping them to build a sense of mastery and just helping them to rebuild, um, seeing where they do have control uh, maybe they do have um, the control over some of the decisions that they're making as they're walking through your court and that having an, uh, um, an impact on where, where they're headed in their future, um, helping them to build skills so that they increase their sense of um, feeling like they're mastering something um, through your program, and just acknowledging that um, and validating the experiences that they come in with when they enter your court. And then acknowledging, like we've said before, the strengths that they also bring, that even though they're there for reasons that um, may be more about some of the poor choices that they've made, that um, you also know that even despite their poor choices, that they also have strengths and being able to recognize those that even with, with young people who are having um, chronic you know, um, problem behaviors, that there still is strengths, there still is, there are um, assets that they have, skills that they have, and just being able to see through all of those problematic behaviors to be able to see those strengths and those skills and assets that they bring and helping them to see that as well. Next slide. All right, the last principle is, um, it's kind of a odd way to title this, but cultural, historical, and gender issues. It's all encompassing. <laughs> um, I just kind of like, like to call it, you know, equity and justice, um, but next slide. So this is where, um, I like to emphasize just how important culture is to healing from trauma. Um, you know, a one size fits all doesn't always work. 
and knowing about historical trauma that um, a, lot of, a lot of that experience had to do with ethnocide and losing cultures and feeling a threat to your way of life and feeling um, a threat to the existence of your people as a distinct and unique people. And so really some of that healing that we can um, help to bring about for our young ones is um, helping to address some of the prejudice and discrimination that still um, abounds in our society and um, where that might um, show up in your court and um, really making you know, equity um, a priority within your court. So it could be you know, you know, finding ways, um, like we've talked before about those power imbalances, but also finding, you know, are there any type of stereotypes that really exist any biases that your staff are holding on to and addressing some of those things um, so that young people feel like they're receiving more equitable services from you. Um, next slide. All right, we have about um, several minutes still. So, I wanted to, um, I kind of went through through those a little bit quick, but those six principles. And I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity to share how, from your perspective, um, some of you might be new, but um, just from your perspective, how you think these principles apply to the work that you're, you're starting or that you're doing um, with youth in your court. Um, how, how do you think um, maybe you're already doing, practicing trauma-informed care? Um, so we, I'd love to hear how, how you're doing that. So feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Veronica, while we <clears throat> let people, sometimes I, I know it takes a minute to think through or, or response, but please feel free to use the chat box if you don't want to come off mute, but we would love if you want to come off mute and you want to share, please do so. Um, Veronica, thank you so much for the presentation. I just wanted to quickly share if you're interested in learning more and then Veronica's probably going to share again at the end but we do have a TTA request um, form and then one specific uh, to trauma-informed care so we'll share both of those links in the chat so you have them um, while you're thinking about this question. So while people are thinking, oh, while people are thinking, just I'm curious, I know we have Anna and we have Jacob, I believe on still. What are your thoughts around how to embed these principles within the work of Juvenile Healing to Wellness Court. So I've had the benefit of getting to work with Veronica for a while now. <laughs> so have gotten to think about this. Uh, and I think that when you're early in development of your Juvenile Healing to Wellness Court, or even if you already have um, a court established, I think it's really easy to kind of walk back through all of your policies and procedures and to really consider each of those principles and are the ways that you're interacting. Because I think it's moving from theory to actual practice, I think sometimes is, is difficult, but when you actually 
think about a certain policy or the way that you are interacting with the youth who are coming into the program, it's easier to look at those principles and ask the, ask those questions. You know, is the way that we're doing our orientation and our intake process, you know, allowing youth to, youth to have a voice and a choice in the case management plan that we're developing? You know, are we developing a relationship where there is, you know, trustworthiness between the coordinator and the family and the youth. Um, I think even to just your regular juvenile justice system operations, I can think of an example where, you know, in juvenile court, usually you have a closed docket, you know, cases are sealed to the public. Um, we bring, you know, when we file case, we would have just initials on the filing. We wouldn't have any specific information that would allow you to identify the youth that was coming into court. Well, in the county court system that was close to the tribe that I was working at, they had an open call docket for all juvenile cases. They had a mix of dependency and delinquency cases that would come up on the docket. Everyone was in the room. Everyone could hear everybody else's business. Even if they were calling people up to where the judge was sitting, you still knew exactly what was going on and who was involved. And so I think, you know, when you think about an example like that, we're moving into a, hopefully a tribal court setting, but if you're collaborating with the local county court, I think there's still a lot of ways that you can think, you know, when we bring youth in to meet with us, where are we meeting? Um, when we ho hold court, are we holding it in a traditional court setting where the judge is sitting away from uh, from everybody else that's in the room? Or are we doing something that's, you know, possibly more relational, where everybody's at the same level, where we're talking, we're engaging? Um, I don't know how many of you were able to watch that tribal justice documentary on PBS. Um, and if you'll um, recall some of the ways that they were working in courts was to put everybody, we're all at the same level, creating, you know, equity in the room and really having people work with each other as relatives, not as, you know, I'm in the judicial system, we're separated, I'm making decisions for you rather than I'm making decisions with you. And I really wanna be here to support you and help you on this journey. Because long-term, you know, I think about youth that I had the opportunity to work with, you know, a long time ago, and I was circling back just to double check on somebody and found out that that person, one of the individuals had committed a burglary later and was actually in prison. And it was so disheartening to me because I remember how much work we had done and tried to do some things with the school and some other things with the family and, you know, to see what is it, seven, eight years down the road, this individual became an adult and then went back into the justice system. And it's just so you know, it, it hurts your heart. And so what can we do now to intervene? What is the best way that we can work with youth who have experienced trauma, may, may be continuing to experience trauma that we don't even know about? Um, and how can we really move these principles into our, our day-to-day -day actions and behaviors? Um, and I know there's there's a lot more resources out there about actual um, wording and things like that you can use when you're when you're working with families even in your court documents and in your um, orientation manuals and things like that that you're using you know how can we make those um, more clear and easy to understand so I think there's many ways that you can bring these principles into your work and I think just cross training with your whole team because I actually didn't get really good practical training in trauma-informed care until I was working in a domestic violence program. So, you know, law school, this concept didn't really come up. I mean, maybe some individuals working in clinical settings may have had a very early introduction, but I remember this wasn't something I got training in until I had been in practice for several years. So I think just that um, continued education for the team and participation in these training events where you can learn more about the approach and how to update your your principles and protocols and things like that. Thanks, Anna. Looks like Paul Roberts has a hand up. Did you want to unmute? Uh, yes. Hey, Paul. Um, I work for the uh, Chata Nation here, here in Oklahoma. And so there's still a lot of you know new things known due to the migration since 2020. 
you know, that we are, you know, trying to figure things out as far as from the juvenile service standpoint on the tribal side now and no longer, you know, on the state side, as well as behavioral health that we work very closely with and they working with uh, tribal police. And so the tribal police and the city and the county are, you know, how are they working, you know, communicating, you know, who gets this call, who gets this call, who's going to take the, you know, the lead on it, where the case may be. And I think there's still some misconception about what that means, you know, from, you know, the non-native side, how did they go and handle that? And so I think our tribal police is working with our behavioral health because there's been a lot of, you know, things that's fell through the cracks. And as far as our, you know, tribal, you know, members that are being left in, you know, in the jails for so long that, you know, there's, you know, they have, you know, legal rights to, you know, certain things that they shouldn't be in there for so long. And I don't know the details, but those are some of the things that are being, you know, not, I guess, being identified and what, you know, who has what control of and who has the authority, if that makes sense. And so the intakes that I am conducting on our juveniles within our jurisdiction. And so as far as we are implementing this, not so much as a, you know, healing to wellness court, but as a program. And so the intakes that I'm conducting that I've seen, and I'm in my uh, fifth month in the in this role. And there's yeah. been a couple of things that I've identified that, you know, when I call the parents, you know, whoever the primary guardian is, to get, you know, set up appointment. And so they're already in defense mode. What I am here to conduct, you know, and so it's almost trying to, you know, build that rapport in which I'm beginning to learn to let them know that, hey, I'm not the judge and jury here. I'm here to identify what to get the overall picture to get your side of the story. And there may be some things that I've learned that to, you know, to be approachable, you know, to, you know, have that voice inflection when needed to reassure them, hey, I'm here on your behalf as a tribal member. I'm here to protect, to ensure that your overall well-being is taken care of. I'm here to be your advocate, to be your voice, to, you know, be, you know, beside you through this process, not to, you know, judge or condemn you in a way. And I think I have been, I've been, had positive results, but there's just some of those things that I've done an intake or individual. I thought, oh, things were going to be, you know, good to go. I was going to refer him to a youth outreach, you know, mentor. He didn't have a male figure in his life. And over the weekend, he goes and does something with his mom and ends up having trouble. Please call that. And we had to send him to a, juvenile detention center and so those are some of the things I'm you know I have to the questions be you know I guess mindful of you know to ask versus what I'm actually going out there to do but still there's an underlying what you know hey he got caught with marijuana at school but there's an underlying there that I have to dig and to find out and to use those you know motivational you know, interviewing skills to draw that out for them to want to, you know, divulge that information, if you will. And I may not get it on the first try, but that's what, you know, that's part of it that, you know, you know, like you mentioned in the training, you know, why should I trust you? You know, what, are, what makes you so different? And I think it's that trust that we first got to first establish and, and not so even though that we may not get enough information that we're looking for in our first meeting, but maybe on the second time around, maybe when I make that fall, um, phone call to the parent and to talk to the kid, hey, how you doing? How's school going? Hey, do you think we can meet up, you know, you know, next week to talk about more about what was going on? And so I think that is one of the things that we work closely as well as with our behavioral health to conduct these, you know, alcohol or substance abuse, you know, assessments so they you know, will send me or email me a, you know, what their recommendations are. If they need further, you know, behavioral health counseling. And so that, and I'll rely on them, you know, considering a great deal 
and to build that rapport even with them and other entities and other resources with ICW or you know youth outreach is you know with other resources to help the you know parent and their family and their other situations that may be going on so absolutely thank you so much for sharing that because you really touched on just you know it really starts at the beginning and it it does start with that trust building and how can you do that how can you start to build that trust so um thank you for sharing that um i know it's not easy it's not black and white and that's why i i often say you know i can't really tell you um these are the 12 steps to being <laughs> trauma informed because it is really it can be um there are so many things to consider and it really is about what anna talked about um the day-to-day -day practice that you have and how you interact with um you know how you connect and how you interact um, so i just want to thank you guys so much for sharing and i know we're out of <laughs> we're out of time so i do want to acknowledge that um there were some folks that mentioned some things in chat. So Deborah talked about um, wanting to share this with um, some folks in her community um, when the decisions, decision making comprehend the process, they support change. Yep. Decision makers, yes, yes. Um, and then Jen wants to share. Um, about their behavioral services division. Uh, yes, the clinicians and the case managers, but doesn't, doesn't wanna break confidentiality. But it's good to hear that they are doing some things. Thanks, Jen. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, and I just wanna um, close by saying that I hope if there's anything that you walk away with from this training, it's really just how important your role is um, and how you're in such a great um, position to really make a difference and in a young person's life, whether they have a trauma history and are struggling with that trauma history or not. Um, I think that the work that you all are doing is so important and um, I look forward to, to hearing more about it and feel free to reach out to us if you need any support in um, just finding ways to um, embed these trauma-informed principles in the work that you do. So I will pass it back over to Anna or Laura. Yeah, you can pass <laughs> it to me. I think Laura is placing the evaluation link for this session in the chat box. And then um, just to invite you all, Nikki, I think you are slated on the enhancement training agenda. So we'll have some additional discussions about trauma-informed principles um, in our juvenile healing to wellness court work. So this is not the last of our um, discussions on trauma-informed care by any means. And if you have questions about any of the remaining material once you receive those, um, let me know because I'm happy to connect you with Veronica and you can do follow up there. So I appreciate you, Veronica. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here. And we look forward to our next discussion with you. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. And if you can fill out the evaluation link, it's in the chat. And we will see you all in about 10 minutes.